Hello and welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global crypt- cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastian Quichu. My name is Brian, Brian from Ukraine. Uh, today we have two gentlemen from Latin America as guests. First one is uh, Gabriel Morin. He's the CEO of the Mexican Bitcoin exchange, MexBT. And we also have Steven Morell on, who's the chief product officer of the Uruguayan Bitcoin startup, Monero. So super excited to have you guys on today. Um, we have a few topics today. And well, the thing we want to start off with is uh, the bit license thing, which I'm sure has been sort of a, a hot topic today uh, and in the last days. So uh, Sean Jones has done a brief segment on that, which we'll play now before we get into the discussion. Last week, the New York State Department of Financial Services published draft regulations relating to the conduct of business involving virtual currency, the first substantive detailed virtual currency regulations to be issued by any jurisdiction. The man behind the proposals is 44-year-old Superintendent of Financial Services Benjamin Lorsky, who was once described by Business Insider as the Wall Street regulator who pissed off the Fed, the Treasury and the entire City of London. He regulates around 4,500 financial services businesses with total assets of around $6.2 trillion. The 40-page draft bit license regulations focus heavily on consumer protection, anti-money laundering and cyber security. In a supporting press release, Lorsky said, We've sought to strike an appropriate balance that helps protect consumers and root out illegal activity without stifling beneficial innovation. Opinions on whether the balance is right is being hotly debated on social media and in the press. In an email to the Wall Street Journal, Cameron Winklevoss welcomed the regulations, saying he was pleased Lorsky had embraced Bitcoin and digital assets and looked forward to New York State becoming the hub of this exciting new technology. Nick Spanos, co-founder of the New York City Bitcoin Center, told CNN that he welcomed regulation but said younger entrepreneurs in his circles think the rules are too costly and will crush them. In an impassioned blog post, founder of Coinapult and Satoshi Dice, Eric Forhees, described Lorsky's proposals as anachronistic legislation that will toss Bitcoin into the same unethical regulatory mess that currently governs the legacy banking system. Meanwhile, leading virtual currency uh, researcher and academic Jerry Brito wrote that the proposed regulations were a step in the right direction and not out of the ordinary. Lorsky proposes a new body of technology-specific regulation. Interviewed on CNBC, he said, The regulatory framework covers basically anyone operating in a significant commercial way in the Bitcoin space, suggesting only large players would be affected. However, as drafted, the definition of virtual currency business activity is wide and will catch exchanges, including those exchanging from one virtual currency to another, payment processors, hosted and non-hosted wallets, custodians, market makers, traders, tipping apps, investment management services, and even altcoin developers. Only miners, merchants and consumers using Bitcoin to buy and sell goods and services, and certain New York banks are spared. Seemingly even non-financial currencies such as Namecoin and Ether could be caught, as will escrow and notarial services. The regulations will apply not only to virtual currency businesses in New York State, but also to anyone anywhere in the world engaged in virtual currency business activity involving New York or involving someone who resides in New York or is located there or has a place of business or is conducting business there, regardless of where he or she is at the time. And that doesn't just mean clients. It applies equally to payees, recipients and counterparties. Even if a virtual currency business outside New York decides not to do business uh, involving New York or with New Yorkers, it will nevertheless need to know the identity of all parties to a transaction in order to be aware of any New York connection. Which takes us to one of the anti-money laundering requirements. Licensed businesses will need to know the identity of all parties to a virtual currency transaction, something that's practically impossible today, effectively removing the privacy cryptocurrencies afford. 
Other anti-money laundering provisions include enhanced due diligence requirements for accounts involving foreign entities. So, uh, say a French exchanger who transacts business involving New York and even obtains a bit license is required to perform enhanced due diligence checks on his clients in France, Germany, Switzerland, South Africa, indeed for all his clients who aren't American. Licensed businesses must maintain 100% virtual currency reserves and also maintain a bond or trust account in dollars. Capital requirements will be imposed, but as yet no figures have been published on the amount of capital and bonds required. Other consumer protection measures include disclosing to consumers a list of prescribed potential risks with virtual currencies. According to Lorsky, there's a big cyber security potential issue in this industry. And to counter it, even the smallest virtual currency business will need to maintain an exhaustive cyber security program, including employing cyber security personnel, risk assessment, detection and protection systems, response and recovery measures, as well as annual penetration testing and quarterly vulnerability assessments. Quarterly and annual financial reports will need to be filed and records kept for 10 years, and there will also be official inspections at least every two years. Licensed businesses need to employ a qualified compliance officer, qualified anti-money laundering compliance personnel, and a qualified chief information security officer. The regulations apply equally to virtual currency businesses of all sizes. Anyone engaging in virtual currency business activity who is not licensed will be breaking New York state law, as indeed will operators of mixing services. The draft regulations will be open for public comment for 45 days from the 23rd of July, and only feedback filed officially in New York will be taken into account. The New York DFS will then review and revise the regulations before finalising them. Existing virtual currency businesses will have 45 days from when the regulations become effective to file their applications. Under transitional arrangements, they'll be permitted to continue operating unless their application is denied. Applications will need to include detailed policies and procedures, plans, projections and financial reports, together with financial information and independent background reports on key personnel and shareholders. Their fingerprints and those of all employees must be submitted to both the state and FBI. On CNBC, Lorsky called it a great day for the virtual currency industry. Whether or not that is the case will become evident over the next months and years. Meanwhile, I will be reporting on developments, going into the detail of these proposals and exploring the differences between the New York and European proposals on my blog and in future episodes of Epicenter Bitcoin. This is Sean Jones reporting for Epicenter Bitcoin. So thank you, Sean, for preparing that segment. Uh, so this is this topic that uh, you know kind of took the Bitcoin community. Uh, well, I mean, just caused a great amount of uh, upset in the the uh, Bitcoin community, and you know, a lot of people are calling this you know, the destruction of the what we're trying to build, uh, uh, you know, as, as we're trying to build these new de- decentralized infrastructures. Um, it is, it does seem quite damaging, uh, at first when you read it. Uh, of course, now this is not enacted re- legislation. It is a proposal. Uh, there will be a 45 day, uh, challenge period, uh, during which, uh, Participants or you know, people that have a say in this will be able to submit official challenges and then, within uh i guess in 45 days then it may be reviewed and then enacted as actual legislation but the initial uh proposal is i mean just kind of ridiculous in terms of what it tries to impose on bitcoin companies and bitcoin users not only in the us and in new york but also just like worldwide um so what uh what are your initial thoughts on this brian well i think it's um well, I think it's obviously uh, terrible. If they actually enact that, it's uh, completely impractical. I think except for some Bitcoin exchanges, nobody will actually do this. Uh, so I think we will see a type of a segmentation if this goes through, you know, that uh, people will, uh, well, a ton of Bitcoin startups will be violating uh, New York law. I think for the most part, you know, here, for example, we have this app 
there's some friends of mine develop where you, you like you send Dogecoin. It's called Doge Rain, so you sort of slide Dogecoin and gets in the cloud and gets sent to people. Well, technically, they would have to get a bit licensed, you know, which is just ridiculous. So uh, obviously, a lot of people will be in violation of that. I think the exception being some exchanges like Coinsetter that will probably do that because for them it's not such a big change. Uh, I hope there's going to be some dramatic, uh, drastic changes from the proposed regulation. I'm not so hopeful. But perhaps uh, let's hear from uh, both of you guys. Uh, Gabriel, do you see any implication for MaxBT if, um, if this goes through the way it is right now? Uh, well, yes. Yes, of course. Uh, at the moment, we have to reanalyze them. We consider this the first draft and want to see it's going to be the, the final conclusion. But if this goes on, we're going to have to be much more strict and defining our processes for being compliant with how that is in place. It's interesting because I actually thought you run like the kind of Bitcoin business, which may, may be in the like sm small minority where this is not such a big issue because I presume you have to do KYC anyway. So uh, excluding New York users shouldn't be too much of an issue. Uh, am I missing something there? Why, why do you still think it's going to affect you? Well, we are, we're, we're not only focused in Mexico, we're focused in the in and exchange for, for Latin America. We have to apply MAO at the moment and we're going to have to exclude some, some U.S. customers. Also, one of our goals is to be able to focus remittances and remittances. A lot of the, to Mexico come from the U.S. So there, there's an implication oh, there. So you were actually thinking of having directly American customers in your exchange. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. At the moment, we have uh, pesos and we have US dollars. So we're only, not only focused on Mexico. We're based in Mexico, but our operation is much more targeted to the region and uh, also including US. Uh, what about you, Stephen? Well, in our case, um, it's similar. We are, uh, our headquarters is worldwide. But we are aiming at the global audience, and um, uh, we have subsidiaries outside the U.S., uh, outside uh, uh, Uruguay. By the way, one in the U.S. And um, we probably will have to exclude uh, everybody from New York. But does that mean you'll also have to do KYC on everybody? Because otherwise, how do you know you don't have someone from New York? Well. If you have, if, if you do anything with money, you most likely have to know um, uh, whom you're sending money to. And if you have to know whom you're sending money to, you, you are being regulated and you have to be compliant. And then you have to KYC your clients. Um, that's, if it's not true in any jurisdiction, at some point it will be true for any jurisdiction. Um, the, the thing is that in Normal AML policies, you don't have to verify verify every user from the start. Uh, normally, there are thresholds, um, and you probably know this from signing up with PayPal. You can sign up with PayPal, and, and uh, your account is being limited to certain thresholds um, before they go ahead and uh, ask for you know, a proof of address and ID copy and so forth. Uh, so the same applies um, for every other uh, financial institution. Um, so the way we see the draft right now, we I, I don't see any uh, thresholds in, in this uh, uh, draft. So we would have to exclude every user um, even before we came to see him. So what you're saying is that, uh, in fact, this initial draft does not include any threshold. So basically, it, whether you're transferring one Satoshi or $10,000 worth of Bitcoin, uh, you essentially are subject to AML, KYC rules. This is my understanding. We haven't discussed this. You know, I'm not a lawyer. Um, I'm um, one of the compliance officers in Pet Monero. Um, and uh, we haven't discussed this. Hold on, I, I had some interference. Um, I was saying that um, I'm one of the compliance officers, I'm a lawyer, and we haven't discussed um, uh, the New Yorker 
bit license in depth with our legal team yet. But um, you know, this is also this is just New York. I mean, I love New York. I live there. I work there. Uh, it's one of my favorite places. I think it's an important place in the world. But it's just it's just um, one of the places. Um, and I there's a lot of competing uh, jurisdiction worldwide. Um, and I think if this goes ahead in New York, um, and there will be no changes that makes it practically viable, um, New Yorkers will be simply excluded from the Bitcoin route. That's interesting. Uh, I mean, I hadn't really thought of this. As, so, I mean, what what uh, companies will essentially need to do if they want to be excluded from this legislation? You know, if it does go through and it, it is uh, it goes through as it is uh, described in this in this initial draft, uh, if if they want to be able to do business and be free of that, they'll have to exclude New York customers. And some ways that they can do that is perhaps like GUIP uh, track their IP address to know where they're coming from, or do KYC on everybody so that you can actually just d- define it when one person is coming from New York or not. Um, so it, in, in a sense, if that if if a Bitcoin startups and Bitcoin companies in the US and also worldwide, and we'll get to that in a minute and why that why it also applies to other uh, countries. If uh, uh, basically they'll, they'll they'll be excluding New Yorkers. So Bitcoiners in New York also have to lose from this. Not just uh, it's it's not only cumbersome for for companies, but it's also I mean, Bitcoin users. Uh, and if you want this to go to mass market, uh, potentially that's a lot of people. They'll also be affected by this. Let me add one thing because you said something very important, and this is very important to understand about AML policies and regulation and framework worldwide. For and this is true for any jurisdiction. Um, you're not supposed to do something that actually works. And I think this is symptomatic for this draft that we are looking at. It's not meant to be usable or viable. What you need to do is, you need to, excuse my French, you need to cover your ass. So if I, as a compliance officer, um, take the according provisions so that I can plausibly say I did all that I could to exclude New Yorker users, I'm in the clear. If there is still a way of which I don't know how New Yorkers can use it um, by, say, using some sort of proxy or VPN or whatever other technology, Tor network, um, and uh, they can come up with a residential address that is outside of New York. And I have no reason to believe that they are not, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not the FBI. I don't, I don't have to hunt people down and actually arrest them. I just have to do as much that I can plausibly say I did what I had to do. It's all about cover my ass. Now, well, one thing that is, uh, I guess, uh, what I find the most appalling about this is that this legislation doesn't only cover and and uh, is not only subject to American companies. So, for instance, if you're a, a, a web wallet uh, provider in Slovenia, for instance, and you have customers in New York and you want to be compliant with this with this legislation, you, in fact, also have to uh, abide by it and put in place all these uh, KYC and, and anti-money laundering, uh, all, all of this um, very heavy uh, and cumbersome uh, infrastructure if you want to be compliant. And to me, I mean, it, it's, it's just the... Uh, the absurdity that the that a U.S. government state would somehow uh, think that they can also uh, ex- tell the rest of the world how they, they can do business like this. Just to me, is just shows some sort of like yeah, I, I totally agree. I think this is uh, crazy arrogant, but uh, this is nothing new, right? So I think the U.S. has done that in many areas. That that's the sort of yeah, way in banking as well. Yeah, I know exactly, exactly, right. But I mean, I think the the thing is, so, you know, maybe, you know, Monero is going to go ahead and do this and you're going to require KYC, et cetera. But a lot of people won't, right? A lot of uh, startups in other countries, you know, will just say, we don't care. And uh, so if you do go along with that, you're going to make your services less attractive. 
So, because um, if I want to create a quick web wallet, etc., you know, I don't want to give my uh, residential address and things like that. So, um, I, I think we will see that. And then I, I, I wonder whether, for example, just IP blocking, you know, if you block a New York IP address is enough, you know, it may not be enough. Well, uh, first of all, we are not surprised um, uh, that what we are seeing here from New York, because it's uh, sadly uh, what the world has come to, that uh, the U.S. has, you know, super aircraft carriers and they are enforcing their law wherever it is in the world. We've seen this with uh, uh, Kim.com uh, in New Zealand. Um, we've seen this, uh, you know, we've seen this everywhere. It's the last remaining superpower and they're enforcing their laws um, as they wish. Um, when it comes to, um, and I, I'm not getting tired to, to, to repeat this, um, we are using the term of Bitcoin revolution, but I actually think it's ain't going to be a revolution, it's going to be an evolution, because there's a huge difference in the technical innovation for startups in the Bitcoin sphere um, that we've never seen like this before in any other uh, uh, innovation. Like in, in the days of social networks, you could hack something overnight, um, uh, launch it in the morning, and uh, you would be a rock star by, by the next day. We've seen this with sites like Twitter or something. Um, this ain't gonna work in the Bitcoin sphere. If you wanna start a Bitcoin startup, the entry levels are a magnitude or many magnitudes high. First of all, you can program something overnight and launch it the next day because uh, after breakfast, you are already gonna be hacked and the coins are stolen. And we've seen this in the past. Secondly, you cannot just um, sit down and invent a service and say, hey, come on, let's launch this worldwide. Even if you get the, the, secu the, the technical security levels um, in line, you're probably violating uh, the law in 150 different jurisdictions. So you have to, uh, uh, you cannot just start a page and go global. Um, you have to do your due diligence and um, uh, you have to go through a uh, licensing process. You have to solve. Uh, well, I, I disagree with that. So right now, as far as I know, uh, if you just do some like Bitcoin uh, startups where we don't touch fiat, I think the only law you're going to uh, clearly violate if it goes through is the bit license thing. Uh, and then, you know, the, the powerful thing with, with Bitcoin is that you can start your startup anywhere. And as long as you don't have that intersection with the banking system, etc., you know, you can have users anywhere. And uh, so people can totally do that. And, and I think that the sort of starting a Bitcoin startup overnight, you know, I think that's totally uh, or like, you know, overnight or sort of like in the typical startup style of like hacking something together and doing that. I think that's absolutely going to be a huge part of this. And of course, you, uh, you're right, right. If you hold customer funds, if you have like a web wallet, yeah, then, you know, you do need to be more careful. Um, but this is what this is what I'm saying. You, 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 whatever your business model is, um, you have to evaluate. And if you have, have to do this with social network, if you start uh, uh, whatever type of Bitcoin startup, you have to take your business model and you have to sit down with the legal team and say, "Can I do this?" And it's not only New York. Um, keep in mind that um, uh, as often portrayed. Germany being the Bitcoin paradise country, which is not. Um, it's Bitcoin is in Germany a financial instrument and is regulated. So if you uh, just that Germany doesn't send aircraft carriers around and there's people abroad, um, but um, you very easily you can you can violate um, a German federal law, and this is true for many more jurisdictions. That it's the question of, of, of enforcement. The U.S. simply enforces it um, outside its own country um, on a massive scale, and other countries don't. Um, but uh, you're still violating violating a, a lot of uh, local uh, uh, regulation and laws, or you might, uh, and you don't might, but not even know. One thing that's also important to point out is that this bit licensing will also be required for uh, uh, people or, or entities controlling, administrating, or 
issuing actual virtual currency. So in effect, if you just create a new virtual currency, which is, which, which you can pretty much do right now. And that, I mean, and we're not, uh, talking uh, about, uh, you know, all this other stuff like colored coins and, 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 uh, it, you know, the cold crowdfunding, uh, uh, thing. You'll also be subject to bit license. So in effect, I mean, if this would have been enacted uh, four or five years ago, just starting Bitcoin itself would have been illegal unless Satoshi would have had to get a bit license. Yeah, right. But nobody's going to do this. Like, I mean, it's not like people are going to stop uh, creating new currencies. It's not that any of these people, uh, you know, maybe some exceptions, but let's say 99% of people will not get a bit license. So, I mean, I, I think... Uh, I, I see the future slightly differently uh, from Steven. I think what we will see is just that there will be a lot of things going on that are technically illegal. You know, people will just start their companies anyway. And people will start them in other uh, places. People will obviously be violating this bit license thing if it goes through. I totally, I totally, excuse me, gotta jump in. I totally agree um, that, that the way out of this. Um, of this uh, uh, lockdown situation that we have between this crazy, crazy and totally useless um, worldwide regulation that is built on this totally useless and failed war on terror and war on drugs, um, which is all a pretext just to, 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 to do massive surveillance of um, uh, capital movements, um, will be eventually, and I'm totally with you, will be eventually overcome by people massively violating it. And it will be a problem of enforcement. And you're right, maybe your startup is in some Bitcoin friendly jurisdiction and maybe you don't care about the laws of New York and maybe you're not, never pop up on the radar of any district authority in New York and nothing will happen, but you're still violating New York law. And well, we know what, uh, happens or what potentially can happen to people abroad who are violating U.S. law. Sorry, no, I'm just what, what, what I thought was interesting about what you're saying is enforcement, right? And this, this is where uh, things get interesting is how will the uh, U.S. Uh, government and particularly the New York, uh, the state of New York, and we can also anticipate that other states will put in, will, will, will enact similar legislation and not just in the U.S. Uh, how will they be able to, to, to in, enforce some of this stuff, which is just like completely impossible. Like if you create a new virtual currency, for instance, uh, and you issue it and it's completely open source and there's not really like one person you can go after in one cu country because uh, developers of new virtual currencies can be pretty much anywhere. Where, how will you enforce this? And there's a lot of things in this. When you read this, it's like, how are how do they expect to enforce this stuff? Well, they can, uh, of course, uh, put out arrest warrants uh, sue people. Can arrest people when they, uh, you know, get on a U.S. Uh, on U.S. soil. Um, maybe in some cases they can try to get international arrest warrants. No, but I mean, I'm just talking about uh, identifying parties. I mean, of course, they will know. only do it like if it gets to like a certain size or if they care about it. I mean, there, there's going to be way too many violations to like go after everybody. But of course, it creates this huge uncertainty because so many people will be in violation of this. It kind of gives them... Uh, a legal basis or it could give them a legal basis to just arrest like whoever they don't like yeah that that's the risk i, I, would, I would say i would say they can do this already uh, they can and, and this is you know the mass surveillance um, that the nsa is uh, doing worldwide is aimed at uh, you know uh, <laughs> the possibility of arresting anybody anywhere at any time um, there is a big difference between um, two, two main forces here. One is civil disobedience, and, and I hope um, that, that we will see more civil disobedience in the future because I believe it's, uh, it's one of the pillars for freedom and for uh, you know, check and balances between governments and, and populations, the anarchists speaking here. Uh, but the other thing is uh, if you run a startup, there's different responsibilities because you're running a business. Uh, you probably have investors, so you have somebody's money uh, that you're responsible for, and you cannot create a startup based on, I'll probably break laws, but maybe it ain't gonna be enforced. 
That's just not how you can build a business. So if you're a serious startup, you have to make sure um, that your startup is in line with the laws. You cannot uh, users get angry at the, the startups. You know, why are they KYC? Why do they want a passport copy? Why do they want a proof of address? Uh, um, uh, I don't know about that, though. I mean, if we, we have a lot of, for example, think of Airbnb, Uber, or we, and I'm, in London, we had did a longer interview with the CEO of uh, former CEO of Skype. All those companies were in violation or are still in violation of various local laws. Uh, I, I think, you know, that's often that's just something you'll have to do if you want to do something. I mean, I, I don't think getting a bit licensed is going to be the answer for a lot of people. I think it's going to be, you know, well, it's just going to be a risk you have to take is you're going to be in violation of these laws. Well, it depends what type of laws you're violating. If you're uh, violating laws because some, uh, you know, cab driver unions are protesting, that's one thing. If you're accused of money laundering um, or uh, terrorist financing, um, uh, you might see yourself in a worse case or, you know, uh, somewhere else. This is a whole different magnitude uh, that they're going after. Well, uh, perhaps let's segue into uh, Latin America and may maybe we can just start off with, uh, with regulation as well, although we have been spending way too much time <laughs> discussing regulation, although it's such an important topic. Um, what's the situation in, in uh, your country, Gabriel, in Mex Mexico? Mexico. Uh, well, What's the situation of the relation? For example, for our business, we have to apply uh, several rules about identifying our customer because we're talking, we're, we're working with cash. We are a direct gateway of fiat to crypto. So we have to identify our customers. We have to uh, submit reports of the people that, that, is, that is cashing in. And that's in our situation of the business regarding Bitcoin. Well, we had a meeting a couple of months ago with the Bank of Mexico. And to be honest, it went pretty good. Uh, they are fully aware of it. They understand how it works technically. And, and, but they see it as, as too little at the moment to have to regulate it. And they were pretty clear in this part that they understand that there's a lot of benefits that the technology can bring. And they are analyzing it, but they're not 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 going to regulate it in this moment because number one, it's too little, and if it evolves, they're going to take uh, cards in the matter by right? uh, they they just see and how how it evolves. So that's a little bit of the situation at the moment. So Gabriel, if you guys are doing AML, are you doing it because you expect that in the future uh, regulations or legislation will be passed that requires you to do it? Or have you already been told you need to do this right now? Yeah, no, we need to do it. We need to do it. We're doing a an actividad vulnerable, a activity, a vulnerable activity, and every business that is in this sector has to identify all their customers and identify their transactions when they're talk, talking talking fiat. Okay, cool. Um, and what about uh, Uruguay? Well, uh, same situation. And uh, not only Uruguay, as I said, we are in, in multiple jurisdictions. And uh, uh, the, the way it works is essentially uh, it's the same framework and the same uh, set of rules, just a little bit different versions <coughs> in every jurisdiction I've seen so far. Um, so down here in Uruguay, um, we are awaiting a new law about e-money issues, very similar to uh, the legal framework that we've seen developing over the last decade in, in uh, Europe. I think, uh, if I remember right, PayPal started out as an e-money issuer in the UK. So we're uh, 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 waiting uh, for a new law here in Uruguay that would make us an e-money issuer. We've seen the same thing in Paraguay. And uh, as Gabriel said, we are under the same regulation. We need to um, KYC our clients, we need to report uh, suspicious uh, transactions, um, and do uh, the, the whole shebang um, that any other uh, financial institution has to do. Even, even uh, uh, lying to our users and uh, deceptive them 
I can give you an example. Um, if uh, I detect um, a lot of small transactions that look like somebody circumventing certain thresholds, I have to contact the client. And this is actually in the regulation. I have to tell the client that I want to help him save costs. And if he would explain me the nature of his business, I would be probably able to do this uh, more cost effectively for him, which is a blatant lie. Um, if the client cooperates, it's fine. And I get to sniff around his business, which is none of my business. Um, and if he does not comply, if he says, no, no, thanks, that's fine. I have to report this. That is crazy. Oh, it surely is. Uh, uh, if you want to be compliant, <laughs> if you want to run a legal business, um, you, know, you need to be compliant. And if you want to be compliant, um, you're becoming uh, essentially uh, a thug of this um, crazy worldwide um, uh, surveillance network um, of the, this uh, controlling uh, financial movements. Which is, I mean, I feel, I feel like, I feel like with this news, you know, it, we're we're just going back into the same type of system that we are already in, and you know, this is what we're trying to fight and trying to to counteract, I guess. Uh, and this is the the ideological vision of Bitcoin is to detach ourselves from this uh, corrupt uh, system of corrupt governments and banks and corporations. And it just seems like we're just going right into a wall here. Uh, if, if this stuff does pan out as it seems to be going. Well, we will eventually prevail. Um, the thing is, the first, in the first step or in the first phase, we need to bring Bitcoin to the people. Once Bitcoin has mass adoption, um, enforcement of this uh, will become simply impossible. Uh, think of regulations like if you cannot transport more than um, $10,000 usually uh, across the border without declaring it. But you can travel uh, with $20 million in your brain wallet wherever you want. So this is a very good example that this system they have built or that has grown on uh, I don't want to say somebody built it, has just grown, um, will become simply not enforceable on a mass scale. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. I, that's kind of always been my thinking as well. You know, when people were worried about companies like Circle um, or Coinbase, you know, because it's like not pure, you don't hold your own key. I, I never saw that as a problem. I saw that as a good thing because it gets more people in. And then, you know, once you're in, of course, the, you know, that's a very difficult situation. If you can uh, transfer it to wallets you control, that open source wallet you run locally, you know, th there's just no way you can control that uh, from a government's uh, perspective. But of course, that changes, uh, you know, when you have sort of uh, in when people don't hold their private keys and when it's, for example, prevented that you sort of take money out of that. Now, I don't think that's going to work. I think that's just going to be impossible to do. But um, I, I guess that's at least what they perhaps will try. Um, but let's, uh, let's briefly just also go into uh, both of your businesses because we haven't, uh, we haven't really talked about that. And, um, you know, I've, I just said like one sentence about it. But, uh, Gabriel, do you want to uh, tell us a bit about uh, MexBT, you know, what it is and uh, what your plans are? Yeah, for sure. Okay, so MexBT is a trading platform for our cryptocurrencies. We are based in Mexico and our focus is for the region. And at the moment we really beta launch uh, semi-privately because we're letting other users come in and, and test them. And it has been going uh, pretty good. Like we, we have had no major major issue. The technology is working smoothly, the users are are pretty happy with the system. So right now we are hoping this week are gonna are gonna update and are gonna launch a new the, the newest version with a lot of updates. Uh, and after that probably gonna be one two three weeks more uh, in beta before open it. Moment we have Bitcoin, we have Litcoin, we have uh, Mexican pesos and we have US dollars. 
what we're going to be integrating with different payment processors in the following weeks. Uh, so we can take money from different countries in, in Latin America, such as Colombia, such as Brazil, such as Argentina, and and, and uh, uh, the gateways to receive money. Our our main goal is to to give access and, and easy access to people from the region to buy crypto. And your focus is kind of on remittances, is that right? Oh yes. So at the moment, what we want to do is like we want to we want to bring liquidity to the region. Like when we started in September, for example, in Mexico, we were doing OTC, and uh, you were be- you were buying at eight percent, ten percent premium on the market. This has been decreasing, and uh, this is really positive. This is really good at the moment. Like you're still high paying like one or two percent premium. For, for for crypto, but it's going lower. And right now with us it's 0.5% per trade and hope to, to have a, a proper market in the in the following month. But coming from eight percent premium to two percent in uh, in six months I think it's it, it's good and, and let's let's see how, how it evolves. Now, how how um how's the Mexican uh I mean what what's the I guess percentage of uh banked people there and also the amount of people that hold credit cards um is it fairly high uh, uh, no 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 it's horrible it's horrible we are a cash society so it's it's a basically a cash based economy do, yeah. do you plan on on providing other ways like uh, I know, for instance, like in China, um, uh, BTC China has like vouchers that you can buy at uh, at kiosks, which allows you to then purchase Bitcoin on their website. Is that something sort of things that you guys are thinking of? Also, like other ways of of uh, getting money into the exchange? Yeah, 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 of course. That's one of the main ways that we have. Like what you said, the unbanked population in Mexico is is seventy percent. It's huge. And uh, so it's a, it's a major issue, but we have this cash payment network that has 130,000 places in Mexico where we can take cash. So, for example, somebody can go to a convenience store and can cash in 50 pesos or can cash in 5,000 pesos. And they have 130,000 places around Mexico, going from 7-Eleven to Oxo to Walmart, uh, a lot of places where they can... Put, uh, put cash and it would be credited in our system. So that's that right now, for example, in the data has been, I don't know, like, let's say 70% of the way that people is, is cashing in, cashing in. I was looking um, for some information on MaxBT before and I found, I think there was a prospectus, uh, maybe for Seedcoin or and and I saw um, some numbers on the um, remittance figures. So I think I saw that ten uh, percent of the Mexican GDP uh, comes from remittances, which is basically all from the U.S. Uh, and that this was about thirty-eight billion uh, per year. And now I'm curious. Uh, first of all, what kind of fees are usually charged um, when you do this sort of dollar to peso remittance transfer? Yeah, well, it's twenty three billion the, the the amount of money annually that is coming. Twenty three, okay. yeah, and it's crazy because like fifty one percent comes from Texas and kind of so it's really easy to target. And after that, you have Michigan and, and but but yeah, so the fees that I charge in uh, uh, different from, for example, Africa, where I think it's around eight percent. Here, we could say that they have several solutions, like they have like banks and remit institutions have developed different ways to send money. In some cases, they can be charged like 5%. Or for example, if you send $100, they charge you $5. They have different, like, they have they developed these cards. They have, they have targeted through many different places, like the remittance, the remittance issue before Bitcoin. So I don't know. I, I, I'm not accepted about remittances in Bitcoin, but I think there are a few things that uh, that must to be to be done for it to be able in place because it's not only about the fee; it's it's much more complex. We have to understand also that the people that receive money here uh, are well, we're a cash society, but we believe 
in, in cash. We believe in, in this paper, you know, and especially the, the mothers of the people that work in uproad and that send them money, money back, believe in this money and don't believe in even banks because they have their money stored on their pillow. And uh, they can then move from that to receiving their remittance for Bitcoin, it's going to take much more than only the fees. So, so, so that's all it got. I mean, I, I guess this, the thing that could happen now is that somebody, you know, kind of plugs into MXBT and maybe plugs into um, a Coinbase or, or maybe a more, uh, a more a cheaper and more liquid or a US exchange once it's there. And then sort of abstracts the whole Bitcoin behind the scenes and, and does that service, and perhaps can do it much more che- or more cheaply than the current mi- remittance services. Do you, do you think that's a possibility, or do you think the fees are um, low enough that this is uh, difficult to do? Yeah, yeah, of course. So you have to make it transparent, and that's the whole idea that you plug in not there and you plug in here and you make it invisible so, so that people never knew that they took that they that they transacted with bitcoin yes it's a it's a it's a possibility and uh, let's see how it evolves like i don't know for example digital money you know like there have been several several solutions here like we have transfer transfer it similar to mpesa but it's from America Mobile. America Mobile is one of the largest telecoms worldwide. It's Carlos Slim. Uh, they had 70% of, of the market and, and they it, they came with transfer, for example. And they have almost one year and a half working on it and it hasn't hasn't taken traction. Or you have Wanda from Telefonica, which opened the same solution as in PESA in different countries in Latin America. And right now, they, it was a joint venture with MasterCard and with Telefonica. And they closed. They closed their operation in Mexico. They closed their operation in Argentina. The only one that's still operating is Peru. And I don't know. That, I'm not sure if it's still operating. So people, at least uh, in Mexico, and I think in Latin America, hasn't really adopted like they have adopted in, 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 in Empresa. But there's an interesting case in, in Nicaragua. Uh, there is a solution, a similar solution that's called Empeso, and uh, they're using it for for their mobile, for their public transport, and it has like thirty percent, I think, of, of the usage. So people are starting to use that that solution. But they have done it pretty pretty correct. So it has a lot to do with with adoption and how our societies are gonna gonna adopt this e money and this this cryptocurrencies to make make. Um, so what about your plans of expansion? You talked about Colombia, Chile, uh, I think Peru, I saw mentioned somewhere, I don't know, perhaps this is, um, this is outdated, uh, uh, perhaps not, I don't know. So uh, are you planning on, on setting up like local subsidiaries in the different countries that would allow people to um, buy Bitcoins there? At the moment, we are focused on Mexico, and our, our what we're doing is enabling cash in. We want to be able to take money from all these different places. So we are working with different payment processors to integrate to our system and be able to receive money from from them okay. through payment processors. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Are, are you going to have some issues like with local regulations that are going to be complicated, or can you do that pretty easily? Uh, well, that's difficult to, to say. That's difficult to say. Uh, at the moment, the rules that we have to, to, to apply and to regulate our, our Mexican rules, which are really strict, really, really strict. Like, uh, Mexico has a situation about, about, about moving, moving money. And our AML and KYC rules are pretty, pretty, pretty strict. And we have all of the points monthly to the authorities. So in that part, I think we, we're, we're pretty, pretty covered and we're following the rules here. I think we're going to follow the rules of other, other, other countries that are less strict in this matter. Stephen, could you perhaps uh, tell us about Monero? Yeah, let me first say that um, 
I totally agree. This is also my experience. Um, uh, what uh, Gabriel was saying. Um, um, the way I have, I have been in every single Latin American country yet, but from what I've seen so far, most of the Latin American countries and most of the countries in the emerging markets um, are um, see this huge number of un or underbanked uh, people and um, our cash base and uh, each country has something that uh, like a Western Union style service one or more or why we have two like Bago and Habitat where you can essentially send cash around for some fees usually between two and five percent in some countries a little bit higher um, but there is a general trend in Latin America, at least, to move the population away from this cash handling towards some sort of electronic money. Um, Ecuador uh, is a very good example. Ecuador is uh, one of the countries that uh, do not have their own uh, national currency because of collapse. Um, and they just recently started a project, uh, by the way, um, uh, contracting an Uruguay company uh, to develop and uh, sort of e-money um, that will be uh, cell phone based, stupid phones and smartphones. Um, and uh, we see the same thing has happened in Paraguay, about 80% of uh, money transfer in Paraguay is going over cell phones. Um, I think the initiative in, in Paraguay was taken by one of the mobile phone providers. And uh, we see this in, in a lot of uh, countries in Latin America. Uh, Monero itself is based in Uruguay. The headquarters are in Uruguay. Uh, we also have a subsidiary in Hong Kong and we have a subsidiary in, in the US. And we are planning uh, for a further uh, subsidiary in the European Union. But Monero itself is not as, um, uh, as, as much uh, uh, a Latin American uh, targeting company, we are targeting the, the global market. So uh, just as you know, Coinbase, Circle, uh, blockchain.info, um, uh, we are not focusing on, solely on, on, um, on the Latin American market. To describe Monero uh, in a nutshell, I would say it's um, it's a Bitcoin bank. Um, I should be careful with the word bank for legal reasons. Um, but the idea is to um, you know pe people do not really care about Bitcoin itself. Nobody cares about underlying uh, technology. Uh, right now we are <clears throat> we are in a time where in some places you can open a store and write on it you know Bitcoin Embassy or. Bitcoin here, whatever, and Bitcoiners will flock to that place. Uh, but it's only Bitcoiners, and they're coming there for political reasons, most of them. Um, if you want to reach the normal population, you have to solve their problems. Just as Gabriel said, um, the moms believe in cash because that's what they know. In other parts of the world, they believe in their bank account because that's what they know. Uh, or they believe in checks because that's what, what, what they know. So we have to provide them things that look and feel and taste the same way um, that things felt that they trusted and that they knew all their life. So Monero is offering accounts, very similar to bank accounts or say to PayPal accounts, um, and a lot of channels uh, on uh, over which you can access this account. Um, and from there we have this, I sometimes describe this as a box of Lego pieces. Um, we have this uh, box kernel uh, that allows us to build business logic, to build products um, that actually solve their, the problems on the ground. Like um, uh, we have a rising uh, uh, level of uh, um, of criminality here in, 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 in Uruguay and uh, merchants are concerned about carrying the cash 
in the hope of, of, of the daily sales to the bank um, after they, they close their shop. So uh, addressing this problem, uh, reducing the amount of cash that you have in your store uh, is solving an actual problem. And this is what, what we are aiming at. And can you tell us about some of the solutions uh, that the Monero is... Uh uh, I know there's different there's different solutions. So you have Monero Social, Monero SMS, the BTM, and a trading platform. Yeah. Yeah. Give me, give me, let me give let me give you a, a, a quick r- r- rundown so that it's, it's easier understandable. Uh, the core of Monero is a currency agnostic banking system that we call Rocks, and. Um, ROX does on the one side it handles account uh, as I said currency agnostic it can handle accounts in Bitcoin, Litecoin, whichever coin, uh, Ripple, any fiat currency, US dollar, euro, worldwide case or whatever, uh, up to uh, the, you know smart property, common coins, this uh, uh, type of things. And, um, as uh, our CTO said once, uh, it could be bags of rice as long as you tell us how many rice cards are in, 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 in bag of rice. Um, so uh, this is on the one side, and on the other side, it does all the things that the banking system should do. It does you know, user management, account management, KYC uh, uh, procedures, audits, um, and so forth. And on top of ROPS, there is an API. And um, uh, it allows us to build what we call thin applications. And we call them thin applications because we don't want to call them stupid applications, but they are stupid applications because they don't store their own data, they don't have their own business logic. What they do is they take user input and um, uh, shuffle it to rocks, and then they get an answer from rocks and shuffle this answer to the user. Um, right now, we are launching a number of uh, examples like a Facebook application, a Twitter application, an SMS application, um, uh, an ATM that we call BTM, and uh, a web uh, uh, application, and uh, a point of sales uh, uh, terminal, and so forth. We can essentially connect anything to rocks, um, and we are thinking also in terms like, you know, the upcoming Internet of Things uh, devices, sensors uh, could be connected to um, uh, to rocks, and um, it allows us to um, connect this this account that you have that feels and looks like a bank account um, to any type of um, uh, social network or social service, um, and uh, it allows us to target also. Markets like, say, for example, China, where the social network uh, landscape is so totally different from what we know, uh, or from, from, from our social networks. So, uh, when uh, you look on the outside, you see Monero Social and Monero Web and uh, PTM and uh, point of service. But the truth is, um, these are all thin applications that talk to the kernel. And the kernel is um, uh, is a banking system that gives you accounts um, and can allow for any type of um, financial product because we can accommodate any type of business logic. So it's interesting how sort of ambitious you guys are in, in doing all these wide range of uh, of products. You know, it kind of even if you compare to something like uh, Coinbase, this is like a whole. Um, a whole other uh, level in a sense. So I'm curious, uh, are you guys planning to raise like some uh, really big amount around the funding? It, it seems like you will need uh, a really big team or I would say different teams working on all these different aspects to, to accomplish this. Well, um, we have been funded um, uh, over the last year and a half um, through uh, supporters and that are all shareholders now um, from the Bitcoin sphere and from uh, through some uh, private equity. Um, and I think we've, we've done a pretty good job uh, in developing this core system um, over the last year. Now that the core system um, has been stable for quite a while and we started developing all those applications on top of the API, um, uh, we are hiring, actually, if anybody's listening out there, good coders, please 
sent us an email to jobs at monero.com if I'm allowed to do this. And uh, we are hiring coders um, and we are also uh, planning to open this API to uh, third party. Uh, actually, a very interesting uh, conversation going on with uh, partners in China um, who are planning to develop their own set of uh, Finax um, formulae. So eventually, this this uh, will be an API uh, open to third parties uh, and to develop their own solution based on uh, uh, on rocks and the Monero API. So what what's the timeline? Uh, when when will this be available and in which uh, jurisdictions? You see, uh, I'm, we are sort of. Uh, when we look at the split license that we spoke about uh, uh, earlier, um, we are not happy about the bit license, uh, but we feel that we did the right thing because we sort of saw this coming uh, very early on. We, 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 uh, very early on, we um, sort of understood that there will be a nightmarish jungle of um, regulation around the world and it will look so different. And uh, ROX has been designed to, to, to accommodate different, any number of, of, of uh, jurisdictions with different regulations. Um, so uh, theoretically, they can just switch off um, all non compliant products um, uh, from New York users. Um, right now, um, we are in a closed beta. In the next couple of days, uh, the closed beta will go into a public beta. Um, and um, it will, at this level, uh, provide uh, a so-called play wallet with, uh, with Bitcoin test coins. Um, it's a, a tool for developers. I think there's no decent uh, test coin wallet service out there. Um, and it allows us to, um, to test a number of other things that uh, we want to test before we go into what we call real money uh, uh, version that we expect to launch um, towards the end of August. And um, from there, we want to show uh, the capabilities of scaling the system and uh, a number of other things. Uh, uh, we just want to have proof of, of uh, work. Cool. Well, uh, thanks very much uh, you know, for joining us today, guys. And uh, I hope uh, both of you guys will be successful sort of in, in building your products and hopefully people in Mexico or, or Latin America will be able to use MaxBT soon to get their Bitcoins. And uh, I also requested an invite for Monero, so hopefully uh, I'll get that at some point in the near future and uh, be able to test the system out. Uh, so, uh, yeah, thanks so much for joining us today, guys. Yeah, thank you very much for joining us. Just a question. I, I want to know if I can add something. Of course. Sure. Sure. Okay. So, for example, a little bit about, about Latin America and what's what's going on. Because, for example, you have people in Argentina, you have people in Chile, you have people in Costa Rica. But there's a lot of things go, going on. For example, in Argentina, you have the the foundation. They just did the 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 first center for Bitcoin in Argentina. With Alberto from from Bitbay and Diego, they're they're doing really really cool things and have a lot of startups that are that are working and interesting things in cryptocurrencies. And also, for example, in Chile, you have a uh, Adam Stradling. Adam Stradling is also he was ex Trade Hill. He sold almost ten percent of the Bitcoin that are in circulation, and he has he was one of the biggest he is one of the biggest uh, coin providers and liquidity providers for for Latin America. Or in Uruguay, for example, also Astrofay that now is the Ripple Gateway. It's a Latin American Ripple Gateway. Or for example, Nicaragua. Nicaragua, they're working on different things. Right now in Nicaragua, they closed a, a deal to do a new canal next to, to Panama. There's a $40 billion investment done uh, by China. And they're pretty, pretty, they, they, the, bit, the Bitcoins over there are pretty, pretty active and trying to push Bitcoin inside the country. And there's going to be a lot of money coming in to, to there. So that's interesting. And over there, they have Peso. And for example, in Colombia, in Colombia, you have Mundo Bitcoin that are, are traders from, from, from Forex and are doing Bitcoin trading. And they're also doing a, a digital conference, which is going to be pretty, really interesting uh, on the end of the year of lineup right? And for example, you have Costa Rica and Guatemala, that they are also a pretty, pretty active, small communities, of course. 
but you know there is pretty active and the people that is involved there it's it's really interesting inter interesting they are well positioned and uh, and it's and there's a lot of things going on in all the region so just wanted to add that and yeah, that's great to hear so hopefully we'll see uh, cool projects coming out of uh, you know all kinds of different countries in latin america um yeah, so uh, thanks so much for joining us today, guys. And, uh, you know, thanks for listening. If you want to support the show, you know, you can leave us a review on iTunes, which is uh, greatly appreciated and helps people find the show. You can also uh, support us by donating. You can do that at Epicenter Bitcoin slash tips. And uh, you can follow us on, Epicent uh, on Twitter at Epicenter BTC. And finally, if you want to kind of stay up to date with what's going on with Bitcoin, we send out a newsletter every Friday. So you can sign up for that at epicenterbitcoin.com slash newsletter. So uh, thanks so much and we'll see you next week.